Hi everybody, I'm Chris Leatham and today's guest is the Venerable Jay Fidel here at Think Tech Hawaii and um, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. We're going to be talking about national service. Thank you for being my guest today, Jay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you for covering this very important topic. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting topic. Um, you know, and and um, national service, of course, is something that we had uh, as part of the draft. Uh, and then we had the Peace Corps. But, of course, I think the Peace Corps was a voluntary um, activity. It's all volunteers. Now, now we've... Now you're you you said to me today. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about national service. So what is it about national service that you think would be? Um, well, let's start with the problem. Maybe let's start with that. What do you think is the problem that we need to solve? I think it's the dissociation of the American public with the government. Um, nobody feels any connection with the government or the country. Mm -hmm. So everybody goes through life, all of life, and their children's life. And so far we've had since, uh, what, in the middle 70s when we gave up the draft? Mm -hmm. um, that's, gee, my goodness, that's almost 50 years. It is 50 years. Yes. Huh? 40 years. Um, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> 40 years, 40 years right. without a draft. Mm -hmm. And people, generations have gone by, you know, two, three, four generations, and nobody thinks about it anymore. Nobody thinks about defending their nation, helping mm -hmm. their nation, um, being involved in the process of their nation. The, the, the government, the country seems to be a, a party adverse to most of us, to a lot of us. Yes. We protest what they do, we complain bitterly. Uh, some people, you know, try to avoid paying taxes, which is the only lingering connection for a lot yeah, of Yeah, yeah, a lot of just the, 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 and, uh, and so I think uh, what buddy. we have is a country that is dissociated, dissociated well, you know, with Jay itself. I remember when I was in junior high school, and World War, I mean, not World War II, Vietnam was still going on. I was afraid. I mean, I was afraid that I was going to be drafted, sent to Vietnam, and end up in a body bag. I had nightmares about it, and it's, it's a very scary thing. It was it's one of those things that sort of my night terrors as a, as a, as a teenager. Was it because my uncle went there, my father went there, you know, it was, uh, it was a horrible experience for them. They came back, they were, you know, generally screwed up from the whole, from the whole, the, the whole thing. Uh, it wasn't a well-run war. No, um, it wasn't a well, a well, uh, a well-motivated war. It was a bad war all yes. the way around. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, we got rid of it because it was so unpopular. But you know, the unintended consequence of that, of course, now is that our young people now grow up. Um, they're they have a sort of a it's us versus them mindset. Um, we do have a lot. Of, we have an all-volunteer service. You know, our military is all volunteer. Um, I still think we have the Peace Corps or some variation of the Peace Corps out there. We do. We're having a show in, that in the near in the near term. You know what the inside guys call the Peace Corps? What? Piss Corps. Piss Corps. Which is the way it's pronounced in some countries. Yes. Where where it exists. Uh huh. Well, Piss Corps. Yeah. <laughs> like the Marine Corps. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, and to go back to you know the point of um, the end of the draft reflected the dissatisfaction with the Vietnam War, which, was, which had an effect maybe that nobody realized at the time. Mm -hmm. It alienated the younger generations, not only then, but in the years to come. Yes. Just as you said, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later, kids were still having night terrors over the possibility of being drawn into a stupid war. Mm -hmm. That's what it taught us, all of us and our children's children. And, you know, I don't think the people who were responsible for the war at the time realized the, the length of the shadow that it would cast on this country. Well, and also, if you think about it, I mean, it wasn't the wealthy that went into, that got drafted. I mean, they went to college. There were, the parents had money. There was money for them to go to, uh, to a major university or a minor university or a junior college. They didn't get drafted. It wasn't fair. It the wasn't draft fair. It was not fair. It wasn't fair on, on so many levels. Yeah. It, it drafted only men. It didn't draft women. Um, right. And um, so, you know, if you were a, a, a poor um, or a young middle class guy or under, you know, sub middle class, you kind of saw this, this looming fate of ending up in a combat zone. Yeah, and getting killed. Yeah. For reasons that were not nearly as clear as World War II was. Right. Yeah, so, you know, the, the unintended consequence of all of that, I met, I met the guy, the lawyer who worked for the Department of Defense. Who, who was instructed to take it apart. It was his job to unravel the draft, mm. and he did. And he was proud of his work. It, it was a big um, you know, point in his life professionally. But actually, I had an argument with him about it because, because I thought it was, it was not well motivated. It should have been fixed, not terminated. 
Uh, and as a result, you know, we were left at that moment in time with a Peace Corps that was struggling, because mm -hmm. by then the Peace Corps had kind of unraveled. Mm -hmm. uh, Vista, you know, and um, uh, domestic service, that, that had unraveled and still, I mean, it's of no consequence, very little consequence these right, days. Right. Uh, and there was really no national service for er, anyone. Where in other countries, perhaps more successful in this way, there is national service. And you don't have to be on the, on the battlefield, you can be doing it in many ways, but you, you are bonding up to the country, you're doing your share, uh, you begin to understand that the country needs you, that you are part of the country and the country's part of you. We've lost that. And that's why I think losing the draft was a huge mistake. It should have been reformed rather than terminated. Than terminated. Um, and of course, this was one of Nixon's, uh, one of Nixon, this happened during the Nixon administration. And that had its own consequences, of course. But um, if we were going to re-implement a national service program, um, wouldn't we find ourselves, wouldn't the, the powerful elite have the ability to come in and lobby about how that piece of legislation uh, would be developed? I'm, I'm reminded of the uh, Civil War, where for $300, and most people didn't have $300, you could buy your way out. That was really unfair. Mm -hmm. And it meant that, you know, people at the low end of the economic spectrum, they were the ones who fought the war and died on the battlefield mm -hmm. of Gettysburg, what have you. Um, very unfair. We would have to be much smarter about it if we we're going to do a military draft, and we would have to be much smarter about deploying our troops into a you know a battlefield that was dangerous to the point of scaring everybody away. We I don't think we've mastered that, and I I, I, I don't know how we do that exactly, but I think you you ramp up. I think if you ask me, mm -hmm. how can we restore the notion of national service? Well, first of all, you you make opportunities for people to serve the government. Uh, mm -hmm. such as the Peace Corps, and you pay them, and maybe it's not involuntary, maybe it's voluntary, at least for a while, at least to see how it works. But you have and to build a structure. There has to be infrastructure to something like this. I agree. You know, there has to be, you know, a lot of thought and effort put into building um, a, you know, a, 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 a structure where you have authority at the top that's not going to abuse exactly. uh, this, this opportunity. Exactly. And it's going to put people to work in a value-added Yes. Me. So, but my question this is, is not impossible, right? But do you take people like right out of high school, or do you wait till they have a couple of years of college so that they have more skills, uh, more assets? Do you give them the option? Does it is it one year, two years? You know, um, if you locked you yeah. and me in a room for mm -hmm. a couple of hours, we'd come up with a program. I think we could. <laughs> you know? And maybe it would yeah. be after high school, and maybe I would pay for your college. Mm -hmm. Or it would be after college, and I would pay you for the fact that you already had a college education. And then the fact that you have more skills after college that you could bring to the table. Yes. You know, or whereas if or maybe you didn't have the money to go to college, you, have, you were then given the opportunity to attend classes and develop a trade that you could then use, say, uh, a as, as, a, as a Peace Corps volunteer. Yeah, or, I think Peace Corps uh, mm -hmm. graduates, if you will, have right. been quite successful yes. in our world. And they but we have some other experiences. We have some other problems, though. We have a crumbling infrastructure. Do we put them to work rebuilding our infrastructure? You domestically. Know, domestically, on highways. Well, uh, do we put people to work in areas where it's going to be costly to hire contractors where we could use younger people who could develop that trade in building roads and bridges and get the experience that they needed uh, and do or do we work it more like a um, well, what they do in Germany for example they you you come in as an apprentice uh, do we build out a government service apprentice project because to me you know you kill two birds with one stone at least two birds maybe more if it's an apprentice style program the word apprentice calls to mind Donald Trump Remember him? Yes. <clears throat> and the I've fact, heard the guy. And he's talking about building infrastructure. Right. So, Donald, if you're listening, I hope you are. <laughs> you know, most of us listen to you. We have no choice. Yes. But, you know, maybe you should listen to us once in a while. Uh, and the thought would be, if you're going to do this thing about building infrastructure, you should build the infrastructure of an organization that brings young people in voluntarily to do national service. And you pay them. Mm -hmm. And you give them a life. You give them training. You make... You make professionals out of them, and a few years later, you know, they can go off in the business community much better prepared to deal with it. And everybody is connected. They are connected with the country. The country is connected with them. We That's all right. feel part of the same program. The problem there is how to integrate those people, those kids, if you will, uh -huh. um, with the corporate contractor structure of the people who are going to build these highways and right. build these bridges. And I think it's doable. You just create sort of a 
a class of uh, domestic workers, domestic, domestic construction workers. See this mm -hmm. competition already with unions, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, well, yeah. See, there in lies the rub. You give them a special, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, internship arrangement, and you pay them less, but you have them do national service that way. And you'd have to get by a, little, a lot of political obstacles, but I think it would be very good for the country and probably good for the mission of building infrastructure. Well, and here's the thing. What you're doing is you're not just investing in infrastructure, you're investing in people. Yeah. You know, we, one of the great things about our space program is that we invested in not only building spaceships, uh, we built, uh, we invested in people and helped people develop in incredible skill sets that, by the way, we have lost. Those yeah. people are retired or have passed on, yeah. and the things that they could do, uh, there aren't people today who can do the things that they did. Yeah. Uh, which is amazing. You'd think computers could solve all these problems, but you know, sometimes oh. th uh, computers aren't creative. Oh. At the end of the day, it's people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think the military has lost a lot since the draft went away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of that guy Snowden. You know, Snowden was uh, dealing with the highest level of um, of, of national secrets, mm -hmm. had the very high level classified classification. He had access to just about anything uh, he wanted access and to. And the clearance, you know, and all that. And, and he wasn't worth it. He wasn't prepared for it. He wasn't trained for it. He wasn't committed. He wasn't loyal. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't sympathize with him at all. He can claim whistleblower, but we can't have a nation of whistleblowers. We have to have a nation that actually works together on stuff. So anyway, um, you know, to, to me, all these contractors out there, there are 1.5 million uh, top secret clearances in this country, and a great number of them are not even to people that are subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Right. Um, well, so secretaries, if they work in, on a military base and they type letters, they have to have a secret clearance. It's a sieve. Yeah. And, you know, we can't really operate in, in a global environment with a sieve. We've got to have people who we know are loyal and committed and all that. And sorry to say, but I believe that the best, the best way to do that is to have them in uniform mm -hmm. as part of um, uniform services and subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice and just as committed as they can be. And you get that either by voluntary service right. or you get it by drafting, so you, just like in the good old days. So either way, you're going to step on some little yellow footprints somewhere in the world. I'm not going to have Snowdens in my, yes. in my military force. Well, we're going to take a break. Uh, and we're going to be uh, talking with Jay Fidel here about national service. And we'll be right back here with Think Tech Hawaii on uh, the economy and you. Aloha. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you excited about my new show, which is called Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. And it's going to be on Think Tech Hawaii from downtown Honolulu on Tuesday afternoons, 5 p.m. And we're going to talk about uh, to make architecture more inclusive on the islands, which is, what hu which is one of the definitions of humane, which is being tolerant of uh, you know, many people, of nature, of many other influences. So we're going to have some great guests, like today's guest, for example, uh, my collaborator, David Rockwood, who is the author of the awesome um, manifestation of uh, humane architecture in the background. So see you on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. I look forward to. Well, that's just special. Hi. Hi, I'm back. I'm Chris Leith. I'm here with The Economy and You. Today's guest is Jay Fidel, and we're talking about national service and uh, maybe conscripting folks to come back and do work for the government, not necessarily for the military, but doing things that we may need domestically that would be beneficial to, to as Trump says, making America great again. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps. You know, I can talk about the, the experience of, of how I went down to the Marine Corps recruiter's office. And when you go down to the Marine Corps recruiter's office, how, how nice they were to me, especially the Marine Corps recruiter. This guy was like my long lost brother. He was That's like, his job. That was his job. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so uh, I, got a, I went through the APs um, and they did the final hygiene inspection and health, health check. Uh, they sent me on a plane to San Diego, California, and there I was met by a very grumpy guy with a drill instructor hat. You told me to shut up, sit down, sit in the bus, and don't make a, don't make a peep. Nothing like the recruiter. Yes, right? yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so that very long rus, r bus ride from the airport to uh, uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, um, that whole was thing a long about drive. Boot camp breaks you down. That was yes. It breaks you down, and then it builds you up, and it makes you another kind of person, and in many cases, a better person. Well, it was a sh it was let's say let's say it was a bit of a shock. Uh, just because when the bus pulled in there and stopped, 
uh, we saw laid out in front of us a whole thing of grid of footprints on the, on the pavement. And the guy gets on the bus and he screams at us about how we have about a heartbeat to get our butts off the bus and get our feet on the little yellow footprints to stand in position of tension and do not make a sound. The only thing we're allowed to do is breathe. <laughs> So what, were they, what did they intend to do with you then? I mean, what was the purpose of all of that? Well, I think the first was to gain control. I think in the very beginning, it's all about gaining control, and it's identifying, you know, it's, it's a little bit like Sun Tzu. I don't know if you know the story of Sun Tzu, and he brought out the, uh, the emperor's uh, maidens, and he was going to show the emperor concubines. Uh, he was gonna, the emperor had asked him to show the importance of drill and why drill was important. And so he tried to train the concubines how to drill, and the concubines just laughed, so he went over and he killed the, the emperor's favorite concubine. Right there, just killed her. And, of course, then when he said, uh, right face, everybody, all the concubines turned turn right. Turn right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so I think it was all about, you know, sort of gaining uh, initial control. But it, but it does make you a different person, right? You know, um, I think the Marine Corps training is unique uh, to some of the other services, only because it is, there's no holds barred. Um, you can have three drill instructors screaming at you all at the same time. Uh, at the same, at the same, in the same instance, though, they are trying to help you develop a mindset of excellence. It's all about excellence. It's not just all that business about killing. It's excellence. It's actually working toward a goal and achieving the goal without hesitation, in total confidence and self-reliance. Yes, you are always. It's always, there's never enough time to get anything done. They never give you enough time to accomplish the thing that you're supposed to accomplish. So you're always in a high-stress scenario. I call it kindergarten for combat, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, boot camp is kindergarten for combat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a stressful environment. You don't have enough time. You never have any control over anything that's going on in your environment. You're being told what to do, where to sit, what, what to learn, uh, be able to absorb information, put it out there. Would you say that mm -hmm. a, a conscripted... Um, a conscripted military force, in our experience, in national experience, mm -hmm. is a better qualified force than a volunteer force? I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. Um, but what I would say is, if you have a conscripted source, what you can do, though, is you could pick what probably I think should happen, is you take the best of the best out of the conscripted source, those who have, have the, the fortitude, the desire, uh, and willingness to move into, say, a military life or military as service regulars. as regulars yes not reserves but regular right yeah and then those who aren't necessarily that you would say mm, i'm not really sure that this guy would do well here yeah. because so really there needs a to be a, a cohesion. bigger better pool to choose from when you're choosing your career people that's yeah. right but but you also need it's very important in combat that you have a cohesive force yes you know uh, and so if you're going to be uh have somebody who's not going to add to that cohesion uh, then sincerely, that's going to you be problematic. Want next to you on the battlefield. That's right. I don't. I don't want somebody next to me that I can't rely on. Yeah. You know. Um, I want to know that that guy that I'm fighting for next to me is also fighting. You know, is fighting, looking after my interest. Did you go because you were drafted or because you went voluntarily? Oh, I went voluntarily. Actually, my initial intent was to go into the Air Force, but I just that Marine Corps recruiter was just such a nice guy. Yeah. yeah. And he <laughs> promised me everything I was going to get. So. Well, at the yeah. end of the day, how many years you spend in? I spent, uh, my, I spent two contracts with the Marine Corps. So the first one was a, a four-and-a-half-year contract, and then I, I extended, extended, and then I, re I signed up again for another four-year contract. Okay. Why did you re-up? Re re I was going to college, and I was broke. Okay, and that recruiter, that recruiter told me how he was going to get me more money for school. But it offered you a solution. It he offered, offered you me a better just, life. Yes, right, yeah. So my question, this is really an important thing. At the end of that period of, what, eight years or so? Yes. Um, do you feel that you, you, that you were more patriotic than you were when you started? Was I more patriotic? You know, I, I was always somewhat patriotic um, as a kid. You know, I I had a certain certain feeling of patriotism, but there was also a fear there that I was going to not be in control of the situation as a teenager. So I was. Yes, I would say I was more patriotic, um, but I also was much more confident in who I am as a person. And 
from somebody who had a low self-esteem issues, and I had low self-esteem issues. I grew up in a very poor environment, and we moved around a lot. Uh, and my, I would say my family is probably on the on the uh, under the if you look under the dictionary into dysfunctional, you would find our our fam our, our family name illiterate. You, you know. heard it here. On yes, the right here. Yeah, there there it is, right there uh, under dysfunctional. Um, and so uh, it was it was challenging. I had attended 13 different schools by the time I graduated high school. So that's yeah, that's one of the important things I think that we, a lot of people in the country, a lot of people in the world, you know, they don't have ideal childhoods, uh, ideal situations. Uh, they bounce from pillar to post. Uh, they have dysfunctionality around them in one way or the other, and they're not, they're not really grounded by the time they're ready to enter the workforce. That's right. And but if the you military come, yes, but if you come or from dedication a, to national service right? can change that. It can, especially if you come from an environment where there's very low expectations. Right. And one of the challenges is that when you you stay in a family environment where there are very low expectations, the opportunity to exceed those and to get into a place where you can move out of that space uh, is really an imperative to success. You know. Um, these days, uh, about 80% of the kids, by the time they graduate high school, are no longer living in a sort of mom and dad Aussie family environment where you have mom and dad living together and the kids are all living in the same household. That creates a lot of dysfunction. We now have two girls for every guy in our college system. Guys are failing in incredibly... Uh, they're dropping out of They're school. dropping out. They're not going into the college. Or maybe they're going into trades, but... Uh, even the ones that get into college aren't aren't graduating, and so we are creating an imbalance. And then especially if you think about the the need for us to stay in advanced, in the advanced posture that we're supposed to be in in technology, we are now becoming much more reliant on people from overseas coming in and filling these these positions and taking up these opportunities, which weakens us as a nation, in my mind. Yeah, and we're more relying on the government to bail us out. If we don't do so well, if we you know, go bankrupt, go off the side, go homeless, yes. uh, we're relying on the government that will take care of us, the social safety net. Right. And so I, I don't think we have the same sort of national backbone about um, getting out there, working hard, making a living, making a life. And I think the military or national service in general yes, helps yes. you at least understand the problem. Well, part of the problem, I think, is the mindset of everybody's a victim. You know, everybody's yeah. a victim of something. Yeah. Okay, sure. fine. We sure. all are victims of something. Yeah. You know, um, if you're, you know, if you come from a minority, then you're a victim of the fact that you're a minority. You don't have the same opportunities. On the other hand, if you grow up uh, white and poor, you know, you still have yeah, economic uh, disadvantages because you aren't able to maybe go to college and get the education where somebody who comes from a wealthy family has. So there are lots of everybody has their challenges. So the question is, do we do we do we say, look, we're better off uh, working from a perspective of giving people a hand up uh, than, and, and helping them to find success earlier in life? Or because in the back end, you're going to end up giving them a hand out. Yeah, oh, I don't think there's any question about what the answer is. The only question is whether people are willing to you know, leave their comfort zone willing to take the chance that they, you know, they might be called into a theater of war and hurt or killed, um, which is another, another kind of issue, and that's a political issue in Washington. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think, you know, the country would be better uh, if, if people could, you know, my experience in the service was that I found that it was a great leveler. It was all races, all creeds, all religions, all together, people from all parts of the country, from all persuasions, all in the same bag, all in the same bailiwick. You had mm -hmm. to deal with each other. It was totally democratic. Right. And it was totally, it was like universal. All of a sudden, I was not a member of a, a group from one state or the other, or one neighbor or the other. Mm -hmm. I was a member of a group that was national, in fact, international, and I really enjoyed spreading my wings into that group. And that really helped me figure out my role in the world. Well, I will tell you, Jay, for me, I, my first duty station was in Japan. Not, not Okinawa, but in mainland Japan. And when I, my feet hit the ground in Japan, having had a really not, not so great childhood, I said, this is a chance for me to rewrite my life. I get a do-over. Today is a do-over. Nobody knows me. Nobody's ever met me before. What they know about me from this day forward 
has not only to do with what I present. And it was true, wasn't it? Yes. You really did have that opportunity. Yes. You really took advantage of it. I did. Thanks to the fact that you had gone into the Marine Corps. It changed your life. And I think, I mean, of course, we're talking about the military largely here, but we're also, we should also be talking about, you know, civilian national service where people can have that opportunity. They can see the broader picture. They can feel connected with the United States. Right. They can see that they are part of it. It is part of them and that we can't afford, you know, not to be the United States. We can't afford to, you know, all be beaten up on the country all the time. That's right. And, uh, and, 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 and we're going to lose our country that way. Yes. So to me, national service is the way you keep your country. It's the way you keep your country. And for the young people, it's a chance to recast their lives. You know, a chance to start afresh and have opportunities that otherwise would not have been provided to you. Huge so I think mutual benefit. Yes, Nothing so. to lose, everything to win. I think win. everybody wins. I think and we're And I think we then. just need to get whatever obstacles are in the, in the way, we need to sort of learn how to push those aside. Uh, because the, the interest of contractors and unions shouldn't take precedent over the, the interest of our nation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Jay. Great Thank you for being on the show. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. <laughs> I'm Chris Letha with Economy and You with today's guest, Jay Fidel. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Have a great day. Aloha.